Aloha, and welcome to a very special edition of Living Aloha. I'm here with a guest uh, that is just so marvelous. This man has written, I think we're up to 14 books, 14 mm -hmm. books, many, many, uh, let's see, cassettes, and even a CD now. His name is Dr. Wayne Dyer, and he's a part-time Maui resident. Yes, I am. I have been for 14 years. Yes. Is it 14 years? Mm -hmm. Okay. Every summer you come out? We come here for about two months every year. And uh -huh. I've written quite a few of my books here. Conceived several of my children here. We're, I was married here on Maui. Wow. Uh, so this is uh, like home for us. A place very close to your heart. Yes, it is. Yes. On Living Aloha, we talk about what it takes to live in the spirit of Aloha. Mm. The true meaning of the word Aloha, because we find sometimes on the islands, you know, you use the word too much, and sometimes you forget what it means. We mm. say aloha hundreds of times in the course of a week. Mm. And I don't know if we really have a chance sometimes in the course of a day to really even live that mm -hmm. aloha word. It's a beautiful, beautiful word. Um, and if we all can live with that spirit of aloha, mm -hmm. we really are living in a wonderful way. We're really bringing kind of heaven to earth. We're yeah. living, if we could really live with sharing of what our true self is and sharing that love we have in our heart with another person, mm. I think, I keep thinking, what what better way to live, yeah. right? And you see it, uh, you see it in the islands a great deal, much more you do uh, than I do in other parts of the world. Um, I think it's really getting in touch with a different part of yourself. I think that most of us don't understand that there's there's really two parts to this business of being human, this human equation. You know, one part is the uh, is the physical, or the, and most of us live under the spell of matter. Uh, we we're so anchored in the in what we see with our senses and what we experience in the physical world that we've almost forfeited our ability to get into the part the the dimension which causes that. So the one part that physical is the ego. And the ego is the part of us that says I'm important and uh, I'm separate. And I have to be, uh, I have to be proven right, and I have to consume, and I have to uh, put a, put a lot of attention on on appearances and so on. Whereas the sacred self, or the sacred part of ourselves, the aloha part of ourselves, is really the part that just wants us to be at peace and wants us to experience a sense of bliss. And it's like really understanding. It's like um, if you look around you at all the things that you observe in the world, you notice your body and you notice it changing, and if you know, and you notice the physical world and all the changes that are taking place. But the, uh, the the cause of everything in the physical world is not in the physical world. Like I just had a friend who called me the other day and said they were expecting a baby, and, and his wife is uh, three weeks pregnant, and um, and he said that she, she's just like a, a, a couple of centimeters long, his little child, you know. And I said, imagine everything that that child needs for the physical dimension, for the physical journey that it's going to take, it's already in there, you know. So that the cause of all of the things that are going to happen to it in, in all of the physical world are all handled for it already. And it's in that invisible domain. And once we learn how to get into that invisible domain, that unseen dimension, um, we can start really creating what I call miracles in our lives. We can... Uh, well, your book, Real Magic, of course, mm, talks a lot yeah. about that. And your new book, Your Sacred Self, it's, I've just got this book and I'm reading it now. And uh, it's a marvelous book. It, be, it really talks about what we're talking about. Because what happens is, in our world, we're all kind of geared toward thinking, well, we want to be powerful, we want to have money, we want to feel safe and secure behind what we build up. Mm. And we do build up a mask that goes with that. You talk about removing the mask. Uh, you have a great quote in the beginning of the book. Uh, something about, I always wanted to be, yeah, all, my, all my life, I wanted to be somebody. Now I'm finally somebody, but it isn't me. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people have that. asked me what that means. And what it really means is that um, when you discover who you really are, you know, when they ask Jesus uh, and they ask Buddha the same question, what, what is real? How do we know what is real? And they both answered the same. Their answer was, that is real, which never changes. And anything that is in the world of the changing isn't real. So that um, if you look at uh, your life and your body and your world and you ask yourself, what part of me meets that criteria for being real? Uh, you certainly know it isn't your body. I mean, we're all in different bodies that are shifting and changing all the time. And uh, we, know it's not our, we know it's not our thoughts. Our thoughts are constantly changing. So it's like um, finding the part of you that is changeless, that is eternal. And that is what I call the witness. That's the, that's the e eternal part of who you are. So there's the, the two worlds that we're in are the world that we notice, 
So everything around us that we notice is one world. And then there's the noticer. And the noticer is in there noticing. And the noticer is ageless. Like the, the, I was up in Boston just a few weeks ago, and I was up there with my wife, and I was running. It was about 4 o'clock in the morning, and we finished about 5.30. And there's a fence, a fence about uh, this high, about four feet off the ground. And I ran up to the fence. I was going to run back over to the hotel. And I, I looked at that fence, and I jumped right over the fence. Just jumped right over. It's a good size jump. Uh, yeah. And my wife looked at me, and she said, you can't do that. I said, you can't. She said, you're 55 years old. You don't jump over fences when you're 55 years old. I said, oh, I forgot. You <laughs> see, the part of me that wants to jump over fences, the part of me that has been looking out and observing this whole journey that I'm on, has never aged, not one bit. It's in a dimension that is ageless. And that's what the sacred part of us is. It's like learning how to get into that part of ourselves and go there. And, that's, and once you can do that, then you can do these miracles. You know, mm -hmm. Then you can begin to manage the coincidences of your life. You can, have, you can create the energy to have whatever you need show up for you in your life. And most of us think that, the, most people think that they don't have the power to do that. That, oh, that's something that, that uh, God can do. Or that's something that uh, Jesus can do. That's something that Buddha can do. That's not anything. I don't have that. And most of us don't understand that, uh, that we are the guru. I mean, we, it, it is within ourselves. And most of us live in a... Uh, a paradigm that says it's outside of me and maybe it will be nice to me and maybe it'll be kind to me if everything goes well. There's something in our natures that always are kind of afraid to show that other, the real self, the sacred self as you call it. It's almost like um, we're taught that you should keep it secret or hidden mm -hmm. because uh, I guess all of our life we're spending all this time m maintaining the things that are changing because mm. they break all the time and they yeah. need more and more yeah. work especially as they get older. Mm. Bodies and mechanics etc. But you really need to maintain and, and work and give almost as much energy to the other side of yourself that you don't see, that is well, changing. The side too, of you that, does, that you don't see, that, that is the, the observer, the witness, is the cause of everything in the physical world. The physical world is like, uh, if, if, I gave, if I were to hand you an acorn and I say, okay, uh, what will happen to this acorn if I plant it and water it? You say, well, it will become, in 50 years, it will become a giant oak tree. So you say, well, in that acorn, then there's treeness. There's something called treeness in that acorn. Show them it to me. And if you look at the acorn, you try to find a tree in there, you can't find it. The cause of the tree is in an unseen dimension. You can't ever get a hold of that. And the same thing is true with each and every one of us. We don't make a decision every day that our hair is going to fall out, all right, or that the wrinkles are going to appear, or that whatever. These are all, ki these are all things that are taking place because of an unseen kind of dimension. And most of us have forfeited our ability to get into that dimension, which causes the physical world. Mm -hmm. And that's where miracles come from. When you get to the place in your life when you can say, I am not what I observe. I am the observer. I'm not what I notice out there. Okay, that's just, the, that, uh, Emily Dickinson had this wonderful poem. She said, this quiet dust was gentlemen and ladies and lads and girls, was laughter and ability and sighing and frocks and curls. You take a handful of dust and you look at it and you say, this was, this, that's what she's saying, this was gentlemen and ladies. And it's like if you look at yourself, you know that that's where you're headed. The physical you is headed to be quiet dust because everything in the physical world manifests, then it's here, and then it goes. And then it's, but the observer, the eternal part of us, the spirit, the soul, whatever you want to call it, is the part of us that is what causes and brings into what I call manifestation. That's why I did this manifesting meditation, teaching people how to literally manifest. Mm -hmm. You know, the, they said that Christ, Jesus Christ had the gift of fish and loaves, which meant that he could manifest food from his consciousness. Mm -hmm. right? He had what we call city. He lived at what we call city consciousness, which is what Sai Baba lives at. And this is the uh, consciousness where there's no time lag between having a thought and having it materialize into the physical world. Mm -hmm. now, now, Christ also said through St. John, even the least among you can do all that I have done and even greater things. That you have that within you. You have within you the capacity to do it, but you have forfeited your ability to do so because you live under the spell of matter. You think that, what, you think that this is your home. That's why he said, live, you know, be in the world, but not of the world. You know, this isn't your home. This is just a place where you fill out the forms and go, you, know, you do what you've got to do. But who you truly are, and when you, when you, and see, most people say, okay, that's great, but how do I get there? Yeah. How do I get into that other dimension? Right. And that's, that's where you have to learn to get quiet. That's, what, that's why you have to learn to meditate. 
or you know because God's one and only voice is silence and mm -hmm. in, in order to experience what I'm talking about you have to be able to go within and get very very quiet if you want to know about God read the Bible go to church do all the things that you you've been taught to do if you want to know God if you truly want to know God then you have to go within you have to get silent and you have to get quiet because that's that's where you'll discover it and it's within yourself that you discover it where does it where's that bridge between where we finally do go inside, gone from reading about it to experiencing it, to taking it and seeing you as God and mm. seeing you, as, so I can get past that, getting angry if you could cut me off on a, on a road when I'm mm. in a hurry, I've yeah. got to be somewhere, yeah. uh, you know? Where do you make that connection where under the daily stress, I, I don't swear at you, you know, for mm -hmm. being rude to me, mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, see you as God under the, under the pressure, or being able to really sense the aloha under mm. the stress, stressful situations. You, you have to really transcend the beliefs that you've had handed to you. See, most of us are, Jackson Brown had a wonderful song called For a Dancer. Back That's in the one 70s. of my favorites. Yeah. I love Jackson Just do Brown. the steps that you've been shown by everyone you've ever known until the dance becomes your very own. And most of us are just dancers, dancing mm -hmm. the steps that other people have shown us. And that, but he said, he does say later in there that, that, but in the end, there is one dance you'll do alone. And so in order to become like the choreography of, of your life, not the dancer in your life, and to live that aloha thing you're speaking about, you have to uh, get rid of all of the training that you've had. I mean, it's like, the, if you don't have a story, you don't have to live up to it. Hmm. So it's like, you've got to get rid of your story. Wow. That's, and, there's and, a, that's pretty inbred. You were a counselor for years hmm. and years and years. You did counseling. Yes. And you know how strong we're always trained to believe what we see and mm -hmm. as we grow up we, we build a very strong mask and you've seen what it does to people our personalities are a lot of people's securities you know yeah but if you want to reach heightened awareness if you want to reach the state where you can become your own miracle worker and literally get to know the sacred part of yourself and live a life of peace and a life of bliss um, you have to go beyond all of that you, you have to see you know you're not a woman I'm not a man uh, you're not uh, you're not blonde, I'm not a brunette, you're not a, a, a Jew, you're not a Catholic. And, uh, we have to understand that, the, that who we are is, uh, is that divine, unseen spirit that is just manifested in just different forms and that we're all connected. You know, in the Native American traditions, they say that uh, no tree has branches so foolish as to fight among themselves. Hmm. And a, a tree that That's would beautiful. have, yeah, tr branches that would fight would destroy the tree. So it's all, it's like, when I say you've got to go out and you've got to erase your past, that's what the first couple chapters of this book are about, really just getting rid of some of these ideas. And there's and little tricks here. Ego is pretty smart. Well, huh? the ego is the it's part of you that, that, that wants to keep you rooted just, in this physical, in physical domain. There's always some yeah. reason to, you know. It tells you you're important, you're special, other people have to prove it, you should be offended, you know, and when other people don't recognize you, you have a right to be upset and all of that, whereas your sacred self says you just have to be at peace. So that when you have a choice to be right, which is what your ego says, you've got to be right. You have no, they have no, they're wrong, don't you understand? When you have a choice to be right or to be kind, which is what your sacred self says, just be kind. You don't have to be right. You know, you, the subtitle of this book is called Making the Decision to Be Free. And freedom means the, where you're no longer absorbed with yourself. Hmm. You're no longer self-absorbed. So when you have a choice to be right or to be kind, just pick kind. Hmm. So if you're sitting around at a table and your husband or your wife is saying something and, and they just said something that you know, is wrong. You know, they just say, well, we paid $49 for this toaster. We got a great deal on it at Kmart. And you say, and you, you know that we only paid $39 for it. You know, and not only that, but you've got the receipt in your pocket, <laughs> you know, so that you just can't wait for her to shut up so that you can make a wrong $10. That's 10 points for the ego right there. You know? <laughs> and so you pull out the, the form, you look at it and you say, yeah, we got a good deal on it. And you put it back. I mean, that's what the sacred self says. Just be kind. Mm -hmm. Just be kind. The ego says, be right make other people wrong because that, sh that proves how important you are and how special you are. And so half of this book is really written about taming the ego, mm. getting rid of the ego. But one of the big paradigms that we live under and that we've had foisted upon us is what religion organized, what this attempts to organize spirituality have taught. And they say that God is something that is outside of you. Mm -hmm. So that you always have to be praying to something that you are inferior to. I don't know where that came from mm -hmm. because it isn't what Christ was speaking about in the New Testament. Before I wrote Your Sacred Self, I, I went over and I read the New Testament beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And when St. Uh, Saint Paul was, was in a prison, chained to a Roman soldier, he was writing his, to the Philippians, he, Philippians 1, Philippians 2, and he was explaining to them and telling, trying to tell them what to, um, 
how to be what Christ really wanted of you. This was years after his crucifixion. And he said in there, in Philippians 2, the, second, the fifth and sixth verse, he said, have in you the same mind as Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. This is what he's telling, this is right out of the New Testament. Where we got this idea that somehow that God is something outside of ourselves. So the way I see God is, I see God as like the ocean. Good, Maui is a good place to do this. God is the ocean, all right? And then you take a glass of water and you dip it into the ocean. You say, all right, what is this? What's in here? You would say, well, it's ocean, okay, so it's God. Now, it's not as big, and it's not as strong, and it's not as powerful, but it is still ocean, mm -hmm. isn't it? I mean, you can't deny that. It is still God. And that's how you have to see yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to see yourself as a, uh, an extension of God, all right? It is within you. You mm -hmm. are it. It is you. It, 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 have in you that same mind, being in the form of God. You, it's not robbery to consider yourself equal with God. Once you get that, once you understand it, and can go quietly into that space within yourself, where you begin to discover that, yes, I have this within myself. I can, in fact, manifest what it is I want for my life. I have the power to heal, not only myself, but the power to heal others. I have the power to, to radiate love everywhere in, this, uh, in, the, in the world. And you were talking about, like, um, I don't get mad at you, you know, when, uh, when, I'm, uh, when someone is passing me and, or, you know, being rude to me and so on. The way that you get past that need of your ego to be right is that I, I used to use an example of an orange. If you take an orange and you squeeze the orange as hard as you can squeeze it, and I say, well, what will come out? You would say, well, orange juice, right? I mean, in a, <laughs> you're not going to get apple juice. You're not going to get mango juice. You're always going to get orange juice. And if I say, even to a first grader, why? When you squeeze an orange, do you get orange juice? They'd say, that's what's inside. It's an orange. What's the matter with you, Daddy? That's an, it's an orange. Say, fine. Then you extend the metaphor to yourself. Mm -hmm. And someone squeezes you. Mm -hmm. That is, someone goes to pass you. <laughs> someone gets angry at you. Someone says something that you don't like. And out of you comes hatred, anger, bitterness, jealousy, rage, fear, tension, stress. All of that stuff comes out of you. It isn't because of who did the squeezing. Mm. It's because that's what's inside. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that inside, mm. if you just don't have that inside, then when someone squeezes you, as they did Jesus, as they did Buddha, they squeeze them all the time. Out comes God. Out comes God. God juice. Forgi yeah, forgive them. They don't know what they're, that's you know. A, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a, a nice analogy. So I it's like, like then what you do is you just start, you just, so you say, okay, how does orange juice get inside an orange? Uh -huh. And you say, I don't know. I give up. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> okay? I give God the credit for that, and I just enjoy the oranges that come. But I know how anger and stress and tension and bitterness and fear and all of these things get inside of me mm -hmm. through the way that I think. Mm -hmm. So I start processing the world differently so that I can substitute love. Mm -hmm. See, the ego is always based on fear. You know, fear-based, it's like a, uh, you don't have enough. And insecurity in a way. Yeah, but that's still, it's fear. still fear. The opposite of fear mm -hmm. is love. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Jerry Jampolsky, who I just talked to just before we did this interview, uh, wrote a book called Love is Letting Go of Fear. So if, if you understand that about yourself, say so that, that um, the opposite of fear is not courage. You know, because a lot of times when you have courage, you're scared to death. All right? The opposite of fear is just a knowing, as it says in A Course in Miracles. If you knew, it doesn't say if you believe, because a belief is something that's handed to you from outside of you, so it has doubt attached to it. It says, if you knew who walked beside you at all times on this path that you have chosen, you could never experience fear again. Hmm. So once you know you're not alone, and once you know you have that like divine energy with you, and that it is not something that's outside of you, it is with you, once you know that, then there's nothing to fear. And, when, and the, the, the great spiritual masters that I've been around in my life, and I've been fortunate, I've been blessed to have been taught by some very beautiful, profound people. The, one, the, the several things I notice about them, but one of the most important things I notice is that they don't have any fear. Hmm. They don't live in fear. They, they, they're in the moment. They're very childlike. And most important, they're not consumed with whether you like them or don't like them. I remember Abraham, So that's a humbleness, too, then. Yes. I remember, instead, of, instead of the Rolls Royces and the, all the things that, yeah. that instead sometimes... Instead of appearances. Because, yeah, instead yeah. of the appearances, it's just substance. them being able to be themselves, yeah. which is really the God yeah. self. Well, I remember Maslow saying, when I ask him, what is self-actualization? What do you mean by that? Uh -huh. You know, Because I call it, in, in here I call it your uh, heightened awareness, because I think it goes beyond self-actualization. He said, self-actualization can be broken down to one sentence. He said, it's, 
It's being independent of the good opinion of other people. Mm. Now, but you know, that's so hard because it seems like everything we're fed on TV and in the movies, it's all image and more than ever our children mm. want to look right, they want to be right and everything. I mean, I grew up in Beverly Hills. It's all like, okay, are you dressed right? Mm. Are you hip enough to be accepted? It's all based on the outward image, you know? So they tend, people tend to judge by that image mm. um, rather than what they're really, they don't, can't get past that mess to see inside the other person. It's almost it's like, amazing. are you good enough to be part yeah. of this game or not, you know? It's amazing how easy it is when you, uh, when you find the sacred in yourself. It's amazing how easy it is. And especially when you're around people who are not, uh, you know, one of the great teachers in my life was Nisargadatta Maharaj, who I quote frequently in here. And he, um, he was this humble man who had given up everything, and he was a, really a, a master, uh, a city consciousness. He, was, he had the gift of fish and loaves. He could manifest as well. And uh, a woman came to him who had cancer, and she came from London. She was a school teacher. She was very upset, very depressed. And uh, she said, I suffer. And he said to her, you don't suffer. He said, uh, only the person you imagine yourself to be is suffering. And she said, uh, you mean to tell me you don't have any problems? I mean, she, right away she wanted to make him wrong. Her ego was in there. And he said, uh, no. He said, uh, I don't have any problems, and neither do you. He said, your body has problems, but you don't have any problems. He was making a distinction between her body and her. And then she said, but look, there's war going on in Pakistan just 300 miles from here, and, and your people, there's a lot of starvation in your country. You can't tell me that uh, this doesn't trouble you. And he said, uh, he had a great affirmation. He said, um, ma'am, he said, in my world, nothing ever goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Like when you become the observer, you start to know that, the, that this is all in order. And then, and, and, and your immediate response to that is, you know, uh, this is very difficult, this is a struggle, you know, I grew up in Beverly Hills, and I, and I know, I've been around that scene a, a good hunk of my life. And it's just, it's like, when you get independent of the good opinion of other people, it's not like, Maslow used to give this test. Mm -hmm. uh, this was great. He would say, um, it's uh, uh, a self-actualizing being, all right? The person who's really living at this heightened level of awareness arrives at a cocktail party, and everybody is dressed formally, formal attire, black tie, gowns, and he's got tennis shoes on and a pair of jeans, okay, and a T-shirt. And he says, what would he do? And then he gives this test, okay? And everybody's to write down what he would do. And everybody argues for, well, he's independent. He wouldn't go home. He wouldn't change. He wouldn't let it bother them. And he would have this great discussion. He'd say, no. He said, none of you got it. He said, the answer is, he wouldn't notice. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. That's, so, that's, yeah, that's, I like yeah. that. <laughs> so try, now, now try to imagine and, uh -huh. anybody you've ever met right. not noticing. noticing right. Yeah. So it's like Joel Goldsmith used to say, you have to look into another human being and you have to see the unfolding of God in that being. Not the appearance, not what they're wearing, not their body, you know, not their weight, not their hair, not their face, not, not their, whether they're Italian or Jewish or whether their nose is big or whether they're, you know, whatever, whether they've got big breasts or whether you like, you look past that. And you know, and, and it's, it isn't like you say, well, I'm really self-actualized, so <laughs> I noticed that these people have all got <laughs> these, uh, you know, these nice clothes on, but because I'm self-actualized, it's like you don't, you just, that isn't where you are. Mm -hmm. It's a different consciousness. It's a different place. My, one of the great teachers in my life was Carl Jung, and Carl Jung oh, said Robert, that... Marvelous teacher. Yeah, he said that there are four levels that adults go through, all right, and here are the four levels. He said the, the lowest level is what he called the athlete. And the athlete, he said, he wasn't putting down athletes or athletics. He was put. He said, this is the stage in your adult life when you put your primary identification on how strong you are, how big you are, how fast you can throw something, how attractive you are, how pretty you are, all of those kinds. That becomes your primary motivation. He said, then you move up to what he called the stage of the warrior. And this is where you take your physical prowess and you go out into the world and you get consumed with your own quotas. What's in it for me? What can I get? I've got to compete. I've got to collect. I've got to compare. I've got to achieve. And there's all of that goal setting. There's that time in your life, okay? Mm -hmm. Then he said, if you get past that, <laughs> which few do, mm -hmm. he said the third stage is the stage that he called the statesman. And this is when you take your life and instead of saying, what are my quotas, you ask, what are yours? How may I serve becomes your 
uh, your mantra. And this is where life. you're at right now? Well, uh, a big part of my life <laughs> is on that. It seems to be on that a level. A big part right? of my life is on that. I mm -hmm. still, the ego still plays a, a role in there, but it's a much tamer than it was a few years ago. It does, you can tame it after a while. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so this third stage is like the stage of serving, you know, mm -hmm. so you're not interested any longer. And, and it does, this has nothing to do with chronology or how old you are. But he said the highest stage, the fourth stage that we get to, is the stage called the spiritualist. And this is the stage when you have a recognition that you're none of the previous three. <laughs> you that drop all that, yeah. yeah <laughs> you, the, you dump it. You're uh, not a human being right. having a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. You're a spiritual being having mm -hmm. a human experience. And you are the noticer. You are the observer. You're not a statesman. You're not a warrior. You're not an athlete. You are a divine being who has this curriculum to God, this body, this career, this time, and you are eternal. And in that sense, you are generous and you are loving and you are kind and 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 that's how that is the way that you are in your life and the best example i ever heard of it's like it's beyond serving i was in a uh, i had the blessings of being in a room with uh, mother Teresa, mm. and she i believe is a is a is a, a saint yeah i really do walking among us teaching us she said i i do i see jesus christ in all of his distressing disguises in the streets mm, of that's Calcutta. a good very good yeah. description in yeah. all of his distressing mm -hmm. disguises. And and this is an interesting story, Cindy. She was in a, in a radio show there with me in, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, KTAR, and Pat McMahon is the host. He's on in the morning. And he said to her in this, in outside the, uh, before they went on the air, um, he said, uh, is there anything I can do for you, Mother Teresa? And she's like four foot ten. She weighs maybe 85 pounds. She has wrinkles everywhere. She's got moles with hairs growing out of them. She's, you know, she's not the least bit concerned with appearances at all. She's just this tiny, and she, but she radiates a kind of kind. So very much like, uh, like Buddha and Christ, who's, you know, they said that when they would go to a village, they would raise the consciousness of the village just by their presence. She's like that. And he said, uh, she said, no, there's nothing that you can do, Pat. And he said, he was flabbergasted because he's building, his, his ego is what is operating here. He said, well, you know, he said, we've got a 50,000 watt radio station here. We could perhaps go on the air and do some publicity for you. Mm -hmm. And she said, uh, no, we don't need any publicity for what I'm doing. She said, publicity isn't what it's about. And he was shocked. He said, well, I know we could do a fundraiser and I'm sure we could raise several hundred thousand dollars. We could get people. And so would, you, would that, could I do that? Mm -hmm. And she said, we don't need any money. Oh. She said, it's not about money. She said, what we're doing in this is, has nothing to do with money. And so he said, well, I feel so helpless and so hope. I mean, isn't there anything I can do? She said, Pat, if you really want to do something, she said, tomorrow morning, get up at 4 a.m. and go out into the streets of Phoenix and find someone who believes that he's alone and convince him that he's not. Oof. And I bet he didn't do it. That's what you can Yeah. <laughs> See, oh. that's, how the, that's how someone at this fourth level uh, lives their life. Mm, well, we're out of time, Wayne, mm. but it's been absolutely marvelous. Thank you. It's always a pleasure seeing you. Thank you. God bless and you. And talking with you. God yeah. bless you. Thank and you. Um, I'm looking forward to your next time here so we can visit again. Thank you. And I hope people have gotten something from your wonderful discourse. Thank you. Um, I know people sometimes can catch you at Unity Churches because you do I'll make be speaking at the there. Unity Church here probably, uh, well, sometime this summer. Great. Yeah. That's all the time we have for Living Aloha. I really uh, hope you enjoyed our special conversation with Wayne Dyer. Uh, and I hope you can remember some of this and put it into life so we can all live Aloha.